Hi, everyone. Welcome to Final Girls Berlin Film Fest. Uh, anybody who doesn't have their microphone muted, please mute it. Um, if you're Mars, just mute it for the time I'm talking. If you're anyone else, mute it for the whole talk, please. <laughs> um, cool. So you're here to see the talk, Unsafe Spaces, Trans Anxieties, and Digital Horror by Mars Nicoli, and we're very happy that we can have Mars here today, um, yeah, to do this talk digitally for us. Mars Nico Nicoli, he, him, and Z here pronouns, is a PhD candidate at Sheffield Hallam University with the research from Transsexual Transylvania, Transgender Perspectives on Horror Film and Television, and is part of the organization team for the horror conference Fear 2000, which Ellie and I are both fans of. He previously studied film at the University of Roehampton with a master's thesis on transmasculine voices on, on transmasculine voices on MPREG fan fictions in the Good Omens fan fandom. All right, very specific, very niche. <laughs> he balances academic research with artistic output in many forms currently co-running a queer speculative art anthology zine as part of the Fairies Collective. Z has also published prose and poetry in English and Italian, and here short film, Adam and Steve, premiered in 2019 at the Vinox Film Festival in Berlin. Wasn't expecting that little twist at the end. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hand it over to Mars now, and after the talk, we'll be back for a Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and already start sharing my screen. Uh, uh, yes, so um, welcome to my talk, Unsafe Spaces, uh, Trans Anxieties in Digital Horror. And a huge thank you to the Final Girls team for letting me catch up with this digitally as I couldn't present in person uh, at the festival. Uh, as mentioned, I am currently conducting my PhD research in media and cultural studies on transgender perspectives on horror. Uh, I'm focusing on film and television, which has led me to really deep dive into both trans audiences and trans filmmakers' perspectives on the genre. Um, this is, of course, a deeply personal research as well uh, as a trans person myself and as a lover of horror. So all of my research is coming from a very personal place where I am discovering more and more about myself as I find out more about others. And today's talk is really no different. Um, the topic at hand is a very personal one for me as someone who grew up online and found out about queerness online. I go um, reflecting on this uh, topic of virtual space and what role it had for me and for many others. So. Um, I decided to explore how do contemporary trans artists depict and interface with the digital. And uh, you'll notice I am talking here about artists, not filmmakers specifically, because while my investigation did start from film and from my PhD, I quickly found that across different art forms, we are often saying the, saying the same things and talking to a shared uh, feeling. So uh, while my main PhD research focuses on film, I'm trying to embrace a more broad approach, uh, which has been allowing me to think about these social themes and how they resonate with us. And I am saying us by meaning queer people and trans people specifically. So I'm sorry if any cis hat allo people in the audience feels excluded right now. I'm sure you'll resonate with some of what I'm saying, uh, but this is about queerness and before we go ahead uh, into the depths of this a bit of housekeeping um first of all uh, this talk will discuss plot points for the media analyzed and therefore will contain spoilers for we're all going to the world's fair uh, by jay Schonbrand and the novel brain worms by alison ramfe also of course we're here it's a horror festival but i still feel the need to specify that uh, this talk does cover some sensitive topics uh, that might go beyond more classic horror themes so uh, specifically uh, traumatic and sensitive themes uh, uh, 
all of what I am warning for is just discussed, not graphically shown, uh, but content warnings for discussions of transphobia, self-harm, uh, grooming, abusive family dynamics, incest, parasites, extreme unsanitary sexual practices, cults, and radicalization. Um, uh, before we get to these fun things, uh, I'm going to give some background context to the concept itself of digital horror and the way I'm approaching it as well as some background history of transness online. So uh, when I personally talk about digital horror, I am referring to a category which is more emotionally understood than academically defined, looking at horror communities, communities effort to define it. We can look at TV tropes uh, attempts, uh, which define defines it as preying on the beloved experiences of your past and the inherent oddity and vulnerability, both to malevolent users and glitches, of the digital words you made them in. Digital horror is a subgenre of horror that derives its care factor from disturbing the memories of the viewer. Um, so for TV tropes, the horror in digital horror is the sense of uh, nostalgia for early 2000s to 2010s uh, uh, internet and the dangers within it. I think this definition is getting at something, something similar to another community source definition, which is from the aesthetics wiki. Uh, this traces the genre as a development from analog horror. So for example, found footage films like The Blair Witch and Skinamaring. Uh, digital horror then would simply be updating the technology to a new nostalgia, but rely on a similar appeal. And the reason why I'm starting from these online sources rather than some more academic definitions is that uh, perhaps in a meta-analytic way, uh, at some point I decided to simply Google what is digital horror and the aesthetics with the result is the first thing that came up. Uh, so more of an aesthetic focus rather than a narrative focused answer. And this either tells us that Google is broken, which in part it is, or rather points to the elusive nature of digital fear, which is more of an aesthetic, of a vibe, than it is a rigidly definable horror category. In a naive way, uh, these definitions attempt to capture the effect a set of media productions have had on the people writing. And looking at more academic approaches to the topic, I didn't quite find any that came closer to what I was trying to define and look at, uh, what I was connecting dots about, especially as it related to these trans narratives. Um, here are a couple of definitions. So Timur Be Beckman Betov suggests the, the term screen life to describe films such as Unfriended, where the entire narrative takes place on a screen. She also describes these films as post-cinematic in the way that they work more effectively on alternative screens, such as a laptop. Watching these films on a computer creates a more immersive experience because, uh, much like the characters, the viewers are experiencing it through the computer itself. And similarly, Lindsay Hallam discusses what she calls desktop horror, where the entire film plays out on a desktop computer screen. And she argues that the effectiveness and affectiveness uh, of these films comes precisely from the integration of new digital media with traditional horror cinema conventions, expressing contemporary fears and anxieties via the very modes in which they are experienced. And both these definitions and the subsequent analysis of the scholars really get to the core of digital horror and the type of anxiety it manifests. However, I don't think this mediation is limited to productions that exist within the narrative frame of the screen in the screen. Um, as Hallam points to, media is now sort of our relationship, sometimes with people who we have never met physically, is forged and broken through digital interactions. Our fears and anxieties are now becoming aspects of ourselves that exist beyond our own bodies, an integral part of our shared digital world. Um, 
And while many of the examples Hallam and others have focused on come from the mid 2010s, there's also been a more recent wave of uh, uh, especially independent cinema, digital horror, and this is practically linked to the physical material restrictions of the COVID lockdowns and subsequent social distancing safety measures. On top of, of course, the existing advantage of budgets, uh, a lot of digital horror can be much cheaper to produce. So uh, moving on to this digital space has allowed uh, much more freedom in the storytelling for small productions, which have used the formal and narrative constraints to their advantage. And this practical need has also allowed for a deepening of the reflection on these online spaces and the way we as humans and as communities relate to them and to each other within them. But really before or after the pandemic, um, there is something I found linked together a lot of these movies, especially the straight ones, um, where the internet becomes a prominent location where the action unfolds, even where the screen is not the only space depicted. And many of these digital horror films focus on a potential danger coming from the internet space and violating the safety of real life. This could be in the form of a stranger danger narrative, like in Creep, where the main character meets someone online and makes the mistake of trusting them, uh, or a threat to the safety of one's home, specifically, in a physical sense of the screen being this window one allows into the most private rooms of one's house, like a bedroom, uh, and therefore letting these uh, malevolent force seep through. But the inside previously to this interaction was safe. And as succinctly put by one letterbox reviewer when commenting on Unfriended specifically, do they know the computer has an off button? Um, over and over in these narratives, the internet is the place where the haunting happens, where the monster lurks. It conveys in a new package the traditional anxiety about the other, the foreign, the queer and therefore the monstrous. Um, I have sometimes somewhat ironically uh, referred to these films as heterosexual horror. This is because um, studying queer horror and studying trans horror, I often find uh, put under these labels of queer or trans horror, uh, productions that have very little in common, if not their queerness and identity, with whether it is a queerness of characters, of or the authors, or sometimes even just the queer audiences that love them and make them queer. Sometimes we look at something and decide that's ours now, uh, and sometimes we don't. Um, the horror genre has a strong queer uh, potentiality, and I would argue that any horror film has queerness within it, but not all horror is queer, so then why not refer it to as cisgender heterosexual horror? And in these examples and many others in the genre, the fear-inducing elements of the, in the mainstream narratives uh, are coming from the digital world and threatening a previously safe non-digital world. In the examples of the same genre of digital horror made by trans people, a previously safe non-digital world doesn't exist. And this doesn't mean the digital space is safe either. Uh, but it is often presented as an understandable, preferable choice from the character's perspective. Um, looking at the history of transgender people online, the ways we have developed forms of socialization, of community building and organizing on it, on the internet, this preference for online horror over the real life one is uh, stuck in is rooted in a documented pattern of behavior. Uh, in The Two Revolutions, uh, Avery Dame Griff uh, presents a history of trans internet, and he shows how important the digital world is to us. Um, he emphasizes how the internet ushered in a second revolution. The rise of the term transgender, which evolved from one self-identity among many, to a collective umbrella over the entire community. So the contemporary trans movement, as we know it now, with all its accomplishments and its failures, 
could not have come to be without the internet. Uh, Dame Griff also recounts uh, a personal experiences of growing up online and how real life isolation meant that he often was the only life raft. Um, he says, given the risks inherent to being trans in the American South, the internet was a lifeline for many members. Even after I moved away, it remained a key resource and support system for me. The role of the internet in my experience was by no means unique. Online, trans youth found and supported each other. For this generation, the internet was an increasingly quotidian part of their lives. And in many ways, this is uh, exactly the story that's told in We're All Going to the World's Fair by non-binary director Jane Chandra. And I'm going to, uh, before I go ahead analyzing uh, this film, I'm going to show you the um, trailer for it. Um, just a second. Obviously, I've rehearsed this, but now that I'm actually doing it, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, Post sharing. Uh, yes. Hey guys, Casey here. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be taking the World's Fair Challenge. So. You want to join the internet's scariest online horror game? We can't be held responsible for what you become. All you have to do to get started is take the challenge. I don't know to what to expect. I want to go to the World's Fair. I want to go to the World's Fair. I want to go to the World's Fair. I was like watching myself on a TV all the way across the room. They're getting closer. I think I'm turning into something terrible. I'm inside the video through the computer. It's gotten worse. I need to figure out what's going on. <laughs> The forces of the fair pulling you in closer. I see you there, even if you won't show your face. I swear, someday soon, I am just gonna disappear. And you won't have any idea what happened to me. and neglected uh, so in we're all going to the world's fair this um lonely and neglected teenager casey uh decides to participate to a youtube challenge called the world's fair and by performing this ritual um the people who partake into this challenge open themselves up themselves up for a sort of contagion through the web and document gory supernatural physical changes happening to them through uh, youtube videos um, this is all framed through the context of an online um, ARG, augmented reality game. So we are told that everything we see on screen uh, through these videos is part of a joint online effort of storytelling, uh, a fictional creepypasta inspired challenge. And Casey is partially aware of this, but it does not stop her from becoming deeply invested and in a way transformed by it. In a crucial sense, Casey. Um, is uh does in fact go to the world's fair she creates uh in a in a scene this alter ego with a mask of glow in the dark paint uh as pictured here 
And uh, in this mask, she films herself tearing apart the prized childhood possession, a stuffed monkey that she's had since she was only a few days old. Um, then when reality settles in, Casey cries in anguish and seems in absolute disbelief about her own actions. Um, this scene encapsulates the inner pool within Casey, within the child she was and the person she's becoming, uh, also because of her online presence, because of this online challenge. The internet persona she has built for the World's Fair uh, is seeping into and directly affecting the person she is. The physical and the digital selves are starting to overlap with Casey having to face that she no longer is the person she used to be. Um, the main characters of this film are not explicitly stated to be transgender. However, the non-binary director has explicitly stated several times that this film is in fact about the trans experience, despite it not featuring explicitly trans characters, and specifically about the experience of dysphoria. The film um, expresses visually what Willow McClay expresses in defining transgender cinema in the Body Talk series. Where cisgender filmmakers see transgender cinema as a narrative about exterior forces and changes, we understand transness, we trans people, as an internal, textural, abstract energy, especially in the case of dysphoria. What cisgender filmmakers typically do not understand is that for us, the internal becomes external, not the other way around. Dysphoria manifests itself in real exterior ways, but it originates from an internal place. In order to accomplish something um, resembling a real transgender cinema, cisgender filmmakers and transgender ones too need to work from the inside out and they shouldn't be afraid to obscure and unsettle the image. Uh, because as trans people, our experience of being alive is something that is never going to be 100% right. Transness touches everything for us and we perceive the world in that way. And we're all going to the world fair is this. It is transness and dysphoria in the way they permeate everything about a person's perception of reality and the way we socially engage, especially as it is mediated through the internet. This deep sense of dysphoria that permeates each shot is something that I found instinctively true when watching it. I deeply connected with this film, felt the dysphoria, and looking at the director's statements, there is an seems very clear they explain how they explain how the film is in fact an attempt to use the language of cinema to articulate the hard to describe feeling of dysphoria uh, they recount how growing up they say growing up i did not know this word uh, nor did i know the words transgender or non-binary these terms hardly existed at the time and today, I believe, we're still just beginning to develop a language through which we can articulate our transgender experiences, whether verbally or cinematically. What I did know growing up was a constant feeling of unreality, one cut with an ambient sense of shame, self-loathing, and anger. I knew that fiction was a safe place for me to hide. Um, Sean Brennan goes, to, goes on to recount their own horror forum experiences growing up, writing scary stories on message boards and how important the anonymity specifically of these platforms was a, a refuge where they did not have to exist as their unknowingly dysphoric self. Um, and another element that emerges from Sean Brand's own uh, autobiographical recounting of growing up as a dysphoric teen on the internet is the deep isolation of this experience. Uh, and this ties into how easy it is to form unsettling bonds with potentially dangerous strangers. Casey's home life is depicted as deeply lonely, but not outwardly dangerous. It's just her and a deeply absent father in a big house in the woods, disconnected from the rest of the town. We never actually see the father, only hear him yelling at Casey to turn off some loud music in the middle of the night in one scene. Once again, it makes sense that her reaching out across the internet would be preferable compared to the isolation around her. 
she is living in this dissociative, dysphoric state of constant alienation and lacking any personal relationship. Not once does she mention a friend from school or any other human in her life beyond this absent father. Um, she's untethered from community and ends up creating a human connection with a stranger online, um, JDL, who is the only character we actually engage with beyond the YouTube clips of other players of the world's fair game. Um, and those players, Casey, does not really directly interact with. JDL is uh, a much older man who offers to guide her through the lore and the dangers of the online mythos of the World's Fair, but really often uh, pushes her further into the game and repeatedly watches as Casey live streams herself uh, sleeping all night. Beyond some accusations and uh, very emphasized subtext, there is no explicit narrative moment where JBL uh, actually harms Casey. However, the grooming narrative and the uncomfortable dynamics are very clear and seem themselves partially autobiographical. Again, recounting their experience as a 13-year-old on horror message boards, John Brandt talks about chatting with this 30-something-year-old man who posted under uh, a similar acronym, WAJ, and who started commenting on their stories. While they never met in person, they started chatting very frequently, and the director said the film was heavily influenced by uh, something this person once told them. Um, specifically, uh, Sean Brand says, he told me that vampires were real, that his boyfriend had drunk his blood, and now he was turning into one. He told me that he could feel the changes starting, that he was afraid of what he was becoming, but that it also felt good. Um, I remember sitting in math class the next day, playing this over in my hand. I knew the WAJ story wasn't true, but part of me sort of wished it was. I thought, wouldn't the world be a more exciting place if this sort of transformation were possible? And in a mirror of the director's um, personal experience then, the world's fair challenge is transgender in its offer for a radical physical transformation which Casey is attracted to. She knows this might be dangerous and compares the challenge to a horror movie, but also says she likes horror movies and it might be cool living in one. Um, this uh, lingering fascination with the idea of transformation as painful and horrific as that might be, uh, can be linked to what Prosser explains about embodied transness in his book, Second Skins. Here he examines transgender narratives, putting an emphasis on self-determination and autobiography. Uh, he notes how transness inherently depends upon an initial crediting of this um, feeling of dysphoria as generative ground. That is, for Prosser, transgender reality always starts as a subjective realization uh, and the feeling of dysphoria before being acted upon in the act of transition. Skin, as per the title of the book, is central to this narrative of the self. It is an expression that comes up over and over, even in the autobiographical accounts Prosser explores, uh, linked to figures of speech that show up, such as feeling comfortable in one's skin, but also more fleshly embodied in autobiographical accounts of self-harm in the form of cutting the skin, uh, as well as transgender people using the art of tattoos as a form of exerting agency and control over a body that does not feel like one's own. Um, so this desired transformation, be it vampirism or a mysterious online curse or self-harm, um, can become a transformative, empowering experience to those who do not otherwise have any control over an unwanted body. This is what happens when transgender people do not have access uh, to hormone replacement therapy or affirming surgeries. Um, to me, this idea expressed by both Sean Brown and Casey, the, the world would be a more exciting place if transformations were possible, or it might be cool living in a horror film. That 
encapsulates the experience of transness in horror. To exist in a horror movie would be cool, would be better uh, than the tedious daily reality of embodied pain that comes with transphobia and with dysphoria. To see one's skin mutate even in horrifying ways like the World's Fair promises is better than living in this body. And we're all, we're all going to the World's Fair is then a deeply melancholic depiction of dysphoria and this existential ennui that comes with transness. And, um, which I would argue perfectly belongs within the new queer horror movement uh, identified by Darren Elliott Smith. He looks at the contemporary waves of queer horror and defines the new queer horror movement as representing subjectivities that are much wider in scope, taking on a broad spectrum of gender and sexual identities compared to what had been queer horror before. That offer an enhanced understanding of an emerging sense of community in queer horror fandom and filmmaking. New queer horror designates horror that is crafted by directors and producers who identify as lesbian, gay, bi, queer, transgender, non-binary, asexual, intersex, or work that features homoerotic or explicit homosexual narratives without LGBTQ plus characters. So this could be anything really. It's not a genre, it's barely a sensibility. And yet it still makes sense to group them and analyze them together. I believe because of the crucial difference in relationship with the monster compared to straight horror. Queer horror comes from an understanding of the monster, a recognition of us, the queers in it. Uh, vampires, for example, have often been a stand-in for androgyny, gender ambiguity, and homosexual desire. Uh, what I tend to refer to, for convenience, again, as heterosexual horror, tends to lack the same recognition. Inherently, this recognition of the self in the monster and the monster in the self is part of a queer sensibility. And therefore, Elliot Smith points to the way this new queer horror, which is allowed to textually engage with queerness when depicting the monstrous turns the camera on itself, on the queer. So no longer bound by the need for metaphors to represent queerness, it can now highlight the limits of a metaphorical understanding of queerness in the horror film, in an age where its presence has become unambiguous. In, re in recent years, uh, Elliot Smith notes, what we here term new queer horror has turned the focus of fear upon itself, on its own communities and subcultures. New queer horror explores queerness to configure and manifest the struggle for recognition of all queer of all that queer culture represses or oppresses. It is often looking at an internal turmoil or whether it is inter-community struggle or a personal journey of horror. And uh, what I have found as a great example of this new queer horror is also the short films anthology Cybergrime. This is where we go into another um, trailer. Hopefully we won't have technical issues again. Just a reminder to unmute yourself, Mars. Just a reminder to unmute yourself, Mars.
Thank you. Um, I was absolutely gonna forget again. Um, so the short films anthology Cybergrime. Um, this anthology of queer shorts presents itself as a disgusting erotic nightmare, lovingly extracted from the fiber optic cable lodged in the slimiest depths of your brain, and it really is an exploration of complex intercommunity struggle, queer horror that looks upon itself to reflect from a place of queer delight and filth, as well as of um, a deep self-conscious criticism, uh, which I find is one of Cybergrime's biggest selling points. And while none of, not, not all of these shorts are trans in a more real way, at least to me, all of them were, and uh, the term itself, cybergrime, feeds into this uh, digital horror sensibility, perhaps aesthetic, perhaps narrative, that I've been attempting to define so far. And I, I really don't think there is one individual way to encompass all of what this digital horror is and clarify all of it uh, without leaving something behind that would still fit. In a way, what uh, this defying definition uh, makes it even queerer in the queer sense of resisting definitions and normativity itself. And in the words of the anthology's curator, Henry Hansen, uh, most of the films deal in some way with an erotic urge towards self-destruction and how that's facilitated by commercial technologies. It's also about the violent promise of the internet as a place of mortal transcendence, or at least freedom from our revolting flesh. Uh, it deals with many different themes within its short alienation, exploitation, escapism, sex work, body horror, the erosion of the nuclear family, and confronting uh, one's own deviance. So uh, it is through this series and the navigation of the online spaces and the digital through the lens of filth and of kink is how I ended up branching out onto the written form uh, to analyze um, Alison Rampett's uh, brain worms. Um, taking a uh, step back, uh, Alison Rampett's internet is first and foremost a place of filth uh, and the connections, the human connections that come with that, uh, with that filth and with the digital element. Uh, so I'm going to take a step back and give some context uh, for Brainworms. Uh, this is Alison Rampett's second novel, following her debut, Tell Me I'm Worthless. Um, in that first novel, uh, Tell Me I'm Worthless, the internet did not play a central role. However, the main character, Alice, a trans woman, does occasionally earn her living through niche online sex work, specifically specification porn. And this is, in my view, partially laying the groundwork for the prominent and ambiguous role the internet serves in Brainworms. Uh, taking place in a near future Britain, uh, Ramfit's second novel presents a fearless exp exploration of the rise of anti-trans radicalization, reflecting on contemporary events in the United Kingdom specifically and beyond. Um, this portrayal illustrates the influence uh, of digital radicalization onto real life through the metaphor of a literal brain parasite that instigates violent behaviors and bigoted behaviors in its hosts. And the book alternates between two characters, Frankie and Vanya, who uh, meet us at a sex party and enter a BDSM relationship. Um, Frankie, uh, a trans woman in her late 20s is recovering from a terrorist bombing at the gender identity clinic where she used to work. Her new job consists of uh, moderating online content, which effectively means she has to sit and watch hours upon hours of vividly violent explicit content. And when I say we see it through her eyes, which we do, I partially mean that on a literal way. Of course, most of it uh, as a novel it is carried by the narration, but the author's background in poetry and ex experimental writing does mean that some of the book is presented through alternative formats and uh, specific to this uh, talk, 
um, and to the point of Frankie's perspective and seeing the world through her eyes. Um, chapter four is what I would argue is uh, a novel's equivalent of desktop horror. The narrating voice is interrupted and instead the whole chapter is just a web page. Specifically, it is a newspaper article commenting the transphobic bombing that Frankie herself has just survived. And the chapter is titled Reasonable Concerns. Uh, it is a very British, politely worded apology, which frames the attack itself as understandable, given that the attacker was a concerned mother whose child was being treated at the gender identity clinic. In the article's words, this poor mother wanted to stop the tide that was spreading, causing her daughter to hate her body and want to, in her words, mutilate herself. Um, the violent attacker is justified on a national newspaper, while the survivor is left with the task of moderating the comment section. And you'll see here up on, uh, up on the screen, the only comment actually violating the guidelines that removed is from someone expressing their rage um, at the violence. So this book represents the extremes of bigotry and how closed off online spaces feed off their users' ignorance and fear to grow. And the parasitic monster, the literal titular brainworm, makes its way through these perfs and transphobes by relying on the fear and the ecstatic feeling of giving in to it. Radicalization is presented as dangerous specifically because of how appealing it is, arguably even erotic through Ramfit's prose. Following the theme of kink, of BDSM, and overall sexuality prominent in the book, fear and desire are faces of the same coin. And here is where we can really see the internet's duality in Ramfit's work as well through um, the other main character of the book. Um, Frankie's partner, Vanya, uh, is younger, 19 years old, and they're non-binary. Through flashbacks, the reader soon finds out that they recently escaped an abusive household. They have uh, very religious right-wing parents and an older brother who was sexually abusing them throughout their teenage years. All the while, growing up in this environment, they are also struggling to figure out their gender and their sexuality. Uh, at age 15, Vanya ventures on the internet looking to learn more about their sexuality, something that, of course, they cannot safely explore in their real life. Um, for some the obviously apparent reasons of the family's constrictions, but also because of the added issue that they have developed a kink for tapeworms. Uh, they are attracted by this idea of having parasites burrowed inside them. And Quickly, they find a dedicated online forum, join it anonymously, lying about their age. And here we have another literary form of desktop horror, which uh, replicates the forum's uh, chat system. When, when they are asked whether they are a boy or a girl, um, this is the first time Vanya is free to explain their feelings. They reply, not sure I'm a girl, but sometimes I'm a bell like a boy. To which the friendly stranger very cheerfully replies, oh, so like non-binary, cool. And then swiftly moves on to get their phone number. Here on this uh, forum, they seem to find the first perhaps safe space in which to exist freely and without shame. So what seems to them as an effective safe space with a complete lack of real life safety, this stranger on the internet is all they have. And the same friendly user then grooms them into a cult, breeding a god brainworm entity, essentially made of bigotry and feeding off people's hate. This is the same hate worm behind a lot of the online fundamentalism we have seen through Frankie's eyes, including the gender critical also Mumsnet, led by a character who is a legally distinct, absolutely fictional uh, beloved British uh, children's books author. And throughout the novel, which time jumps between Vanya being 15 and then 19 in the present day, they are aware of what is happening. They know, they don't know exactly the details, but they know about this uh, parasite uh, god. And 
I still prefer in this tapeworm based cult community to a much worse home life. And the book does not present this choice as wrong. Um, the characters around them, in a way, affirm Vanya's choice uh, as the narrative develops and we find out that their mother is the woman behind the terrorist attack at the gender identity clinic. And in fact, uh, what initially drew, drew Frankie's attention to being attracted to Vanya in the first place was a family resemblance to the person who caused this life-changing trauma for her. And again, fear and desire, this recurring theme overlap in, a, in this toxic, dysfunctional, and yet unavoidable way. Later on in the novel, Vanya's mom also slaughters the entire family except for Vanya when the younger sibling of the family also comes out as trans. So at least Vanya might be groomed into an apocalyptic bigotry cult, but the threat is not daily, and they get to be respected and accepted as themselves within it. So um, this book ends on this degree of twisted agency, this uh, bittersweet ambivalence in which the rotting, uh, infested digital world is still the better choice over a much, much worse reality. So, in conclusion, um, digital horror remains somewhat of a blurred concept, more of a sensibility, a relation to the web, and a sense of almost being trapped within it, uh, which allows for a specific form of transgender affect. If the underlying message of a lot of cis straight digital horror or more conventional mainstream uh, digital horror in general is stranger danger, do not venture in the dark digital woods, the fear underlying this trans horror is a more cynical and bitter one, more of a helpless fear, a problem without a real solution, an expression of the deep-seated feeling of not belonging anywhere that comes with dysphoria. If you remove the monster worms, the haunted YouTube playlists, what is left is a reality which is much harder to face. And yet, um, by watching these films and reading the books and engaging with all of this discourse, I have been finding one perhaps small comfort of feeling understood, having my perception of reality confirmed in that the worsening of trans rights globally actually is happening. That I myself uh, turned to the internet to learn about myself uh, because like so many others, I actually was not safe in exploring my identity otherwise. I had to trust strangers and so did many, many others. I find these narratives offer comfort in a shared misery, in a shared fear uh, for the many people who must form communities out of the strangers they can find out there, latching onto any commonality. Because the inside, the family, the house, are deeply unsafe spaces. It's not, it's not warning us not to trust strangers of the internet. It is acknowledging the reality that as queer people, we find ourselves needing to trust strangers more than our own family, with all the dangers that come with that. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but much like this works, I don't have a cheerful note to end this on. Uh, when I drafted this paper originally, um, this was the conclusion, and I've been trying to change it. I've been trying to find a different angle, but things have only gotten worse. Things have been worsening. Uh, I, I simply couldn't bring myself to tie a ribbon on all of this. Uh, this anxiety, this trans anxiety in the digital horror is a symptom of a much larger social travel that manifests in the way we interact with the internet and with each other and with ourselves. And, and I, do, I do really believe in the power of art uh, of horror specifically, uh, to comfort and to bring attention on what real fears and pains hide behind a metaphor. And maybe that is a small comfort, but 
right now it feels like all we have. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to me. And I do really hope I'm wrong and things get better. Thank you so much, Mars. This was a really, really engaging talk and so much, so much ground was covered. So many interesting uh, insights. Um, yeah, we, we, have, we have time for some questions, comments. Um, but you've just been staring at a screen this whole time and not seeing anyone else in the room with you. So if people want to turn on their cameras and just say hello, show your face, whatever, you're welcome to do that. You also don't have to do that. I know it can be a bit uncomfortable. And if you don't want to speak or say your question, you're also welcome to type it in the chat. Somebody says, thank you. That was a brilliant talk. I agree. Thank you. I really loved um, that you make this distinction um, with hetero horror, because of course we're so used to hearing the term queer horror and designating that as the the thing that needs to be categorized in this way. But um, I really loved this idea that hetero horror is horror in which the self doesn't identify with the monster or something like this. Yeah, like the monster with the self. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if you want to say anything more about that. I found that. Yeah, and of course, I had a bit of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I think I'm experiencing a bit of that delay. But yeah, I, I did find I did have a bit of trouble with trouble with defining that. Uh, because, of course, my attention is on queer horror, but there very much are other forms of horror that do have this more kinship with uh, the monster, especially when you look intersectionally. Uh, queer people are not the only ones who have been historically demonized by horror. Uh, Jack Halberstam uh, writes in uh, skin shows about how horror and gothic has been also used uh, uh, both as a stand-in for queerness, but also as a stand-in for Jewishness, um, as well as, uh, of course, there is a lot of uh, Black horror that, like, historically has used race or like horror has used race or disability or any kind of diversity um uh, as a stand-in for the other uh, so i'm looking at it from this one specific perspective and from that perspective uh, definitely noticing patterns uh but it is kind of the reason why i insist on it being a bit of a provocative expression rather than a formal academic one uh, is because it is somewhat limited in its intersectional width, um, but uh, useful in the way we reflect on queer horror. Because what does what does Chucky have anything to do with? We're all going to the worst fair, right? Uh, but they're both queer horror and they're both brilliant. Right. For people who don't know, the director of Chucky is out is openly gay. Also. Uh, also has uh, from Seed of Chaggy onwards uh, a prominent non-binary representation with the character of Glenn Glenda, who is also played uh, by uh, a non-binary actor in the TV show. Yeah, I need to watch more of the franchise. I'm <laughs> not all caught up yet. There's another, there's a few other comments in the chat. Um, Henri says the cybergrime film seems so experimental. Thanks for introducing us to this. Lindsay says, thank you for this talk. I feel like I haven't seen much deep analysis of we're all going to the world fair. Your breakdown of it was very interesting to listen to. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh can I actually talk a bit more about cybergrime? Because I'm very enthusiastic about it. I actually had the uh, privilege of screening it with a, a local cinema here in Sheffield recently and had a Q&A with the curator, Henry Hansen. If you're interested more in cybergrime, I would recommend contacting Henry directly. Uh, they're lovely. They're very open to having it screened 
Uh, it is a collection of short films from different directors uh, from different years. I think this, the oldest is like somewhat in the 2010s and then the, the most recent is like from 2021, 20, uh, something like that. So they are very different. The, the shorts are all very different, but then they flow together very well in having this very complex discourse on eroticism and the, the machine and the body. So Cybergrime is, it's a feature film that's compiled, like a, a compilation of shorts, is that right? Or is it a, is it like an evolving series that's growing still? Um, the short, the, the shorts exist, have been produced completely independently. And then Henry Hansen, who is a filmmaker and curator, has contacted all these uh, short film um, filmmakers and put it together in a package uh, that can be screened all together. Cool. Yeah, I saw that Monster Dyke was in there, which is a film we showed a couple of years ago in our queer horror program. So I'm really curious to see what else is in there and check it out. If anyone has any further comments, questions, anything you want to share? Natalia says, I was lucky enough to see Cybergrime and it really does accurately capture the trans online experience of a certain age. Cool, excited for it. And I can also say that um, I've seen Jane Schoenburn's newest film called um, I Saw the TV Glow. Mars has not seen it yet, but I can really recommend it and it definitely is relevant for this uh, discourse too. I can't wait. I'm so, I'm just buzzing about it. Ah, uh, you want a repetition? I was just, uh, the title is called I Saw the TV Glow. I'll just write it in there. It, it was just at Berlinale, so you're not going to find it anywhere super soon, but I guess in a few months, maybe it'll be streaming somewhere. All right, if there aren't any further questions. I think the trailer, the, the official trailer came out recently. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and feel free to also recommend works within the group right now if you have, if you've seen or read anything that you think would be relevant for this topic. I think we're all hungry for, for media that is um, discussing. Um, Something that I've been trying to work into the talk, but then it would have been way too long uh, because it requires quite a bit of background context is also this um, web uh, comic. Uh, it's called What Happens Next. Um, and it's it's by a transmasculine author and it deals with this fictional uh, Tumblr true crime community within which a murder gets actually commi like committed. And then all of these... Uh, very idiosyncratic personalities who, if you've existed on 2014 queer Tumblr, you know all of these people personally. Um, and I think that was an interesting perspective that I didn't manage to balance in, but also because it comes from a transmasculine perspective. So uh, it so happened that the two main works that I discussed today are both from uh, trans feminine authors. Uh, so I do think uh, reading this can offer more of a, a different angle on the same topic. Well, I just shared a link, which I'm hoping is correct. Is that right, Mars? This what happens next dot webcomic dot ws. Yeah, cool. I found it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And Henri recommends Bad Thing, which is something that we might screen at some point. Ellie and I have to discuss that. Um, which, yeah, it does have, I know for sure, of one trans woman in the cast. If there's more than one in the cast, that's good to know. Then I will definitely uh, look into that as well. It was a great, it's really, really fascinating queer horror film, kind of like The Shining, but with uh, kind of queer female. Natalia asks, uh, you touched on it 
both World's Fair and Brainworms, but I was wondering if you had opinions on how trans horror balances the isolation of disposability and the hypervisibility of fetishization. Um, yes, uh, I think especially Brainworms and in general Alison Rampett's work uh, very much navigates these two. I think perhaps the World's Fair does less so because it doesn't really touch too much on the fetishization. There is an element of like the sexuality is more of an undertone within the grooming, uh, but the grooming itself is more subtextual. Um, Alison Rampton does not pull punches. It is a very intense read, both uh, Tell Me I'm Worthless and Brain Worms. Uh, both of them come with a sheet of content warnings on the first page, which is something I've not seen much in books. Uh, to start by including content warnings, but I do think they're very needed for these readings. Uh, I think Alison Rafter really captures how much of hypervisibility is in itself a form of isolation uh, because these characters are fetishized in a way that further dehumanizes them and makes them even more isolated. The excerpts in uh, um, Tell Me I'm Worthless where uh, Alice is uh, re recording these uh, um, CC hypno pornography uh, very much encapsulates uh, how she's trying to connect with this uh, uh, with this person with this client but uh, a lot of uh, clients of this genre tend to be deeply closeted trans feminine people who uh, turn transphobic or fetishistic because of uh, uh, because of their internalized transphobia and their fear of accepting this. And you can really tell that from the writing that she has this deep empathy uh, for the client, but at the same time, this profound disconnection and in a, in a way disgust because of how degrading and dehumanizing the work that she has to do has. Uh, and she's filming it alone in her... Mm -hmm. dingy bedroom in a tiny London flat that's falling apart with mold. Uh, so I think that very specific London housing experience also uh, furthers uh, the feeling of isolation and fetishization and hypervisibility and disposability all at once. They are all, they are all part of the same thing. I have a, one more question. Could you talk some more about the um, the generative nature of dysphoria? This was like one one slide that yes. was out to me. Oh, that. I love that quote. Yeah, just I I want to know more of of what you like where yeah. that how far that goes for you and where else you feel that applies. Um, I personally deeply connected with it. Uh, especially reading the book. Uh, the book is from 98, I think. I included the exact year in the slides, but I think it's from 98, uh, which is uh, a month after I was, I was born in December 97. So uh, to me, seeing something that was that came out um, the year I was born and yet contained so much of my personal experience, I have personally struggled in the past with self-harm and specifically cutting, and I love tattoos, and I'm fairly covered in tattoos. Uh, so all of these things and this relationship with the flesh really struck me as how every single one of these actions has always been for me an attempt to exert control over a body I didn't have control over. And uh, so this transformative power that then transitioning people obviously being trans is not a choice and there's a lot of this conversation about being born this way and I kind of dislike the idea of being born this way because uh, while my dysphoria while my transness in the sense of identifying with a gender different from the one I was assigned uh, um, is real and wasn't gonna go away choosing to transition is what saved my life it, to me 
transitioning uh, and acting upon that dysphoria, taking power over my body in this way has been deeply transformative and deeply, in a way, artistic um, in the way that it was a choice. And it was the choice between living or dying, but it was still a choice because I did consider the alternative. Um, and therefore, I see transness as in a way, making a canvas of my body. Uh, and this is maybe a bit cheesy, uh, but there is the Michelangelo, the sculpture uh, quote about finding the shape in the marble. So Michelangelo said, used to say that he, he wasn't coming up with what he was sculpting. He looked at a block of marble and could already see the sculpture ready to be freed. Um, and to me, that's kind of what, the generative power of dysphoria is is that I look at my body and it is just this block of marble and I get to create what was already there, what the body that was meant to be there was. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I think a lot of the these really fascinating works of horror are also great evidence of of the the generative power. Um, yeah, because the super challenging and destabilizing and uh, exciting art is coming out of it <laughs> as well. Uh, so thank you so much. I think I think that's what specifically, sorry, I think that's what specifically uh, Monster Dyke is getting at the short films within Cybergrime is the whole uh, creating this... Uh, creating this new life and uh, the sculpting element of horror and finding a monster love in a generative way. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's a great film. And I don't know if it's anywhere online for everyone to see, but if you can find it somewhere, it's called Monster Dyke and it's a great quick, like five minute short. Um, that's all kinds of kind of like trashy aestheticized fun, but it has like a lot of uh really meaningful powerful content behind it so um yeah thanks so much mars for being here and thanks to everyone who came and participated and the talk will be available soon i guess in the next couple of weeks we'll get it up on our um, youtube page so you can also share it with friends and um if you don't know our, our youtube page we also have talks from the last few years up there we had um we have this event called the Brain Binge that happens every June, which is a full weekend of talks and workshops. So this is kind of like a little taster of the Brain Binge a few months early. Um, we don't have the exact dates yet, but it'll be in mid to late June. And uh, a Saturday and Sunday, pretty much like three talks or workshops per day. All of it's free to attend. And we'll be um, advertising that in the coming months on our social media. Ellie, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, this has just been great to observe uh, and on, you know, behind a blank, <laughs> black uh, screen here. Um, yeah, I think a lot of what you said just is going to, I'm going to be thinking about, about it for a long time, a lot of the points you made. So, so thank you for that. Yeah, thank you so much, Mars. This was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, All have right. a nice Bye. Bye, everyone.